And um, let's get started since this is um, the first in our series of mini workshops, sort of doing one or two little modules at a time to introduce the idea of reproducibility. So just to let you know a little bit about who we are, Reproducibility for Everyone is a community-led um, education initiative. So it's all researchers who are trying to share those methods and tools that have helped them in their research to advance something that we call reproducibility. Uh, so my name is April and I'm currently the executive director of Reproducibility for Everyone. Um, and you can always reach out to me uh, at um, uh, my email or at Twitter here and um, ask questions anytime. I just wanted to start with the thank yous to our sponsors, Chan Zuckerberg and Adgene. Um, and also to um, Dr. Swessinger, who is a researcher in Australia, who is one of the people that co-founded this with us and has done a lot of this work. Uh, so again, you can see here, here is um, an address you can reach out to us at an email address. So if you have questions, if you have suggestions, please uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out. Another thing that we have in the works right now is a, a new paper describing the work that we do to help spread the word about reproducibility. So if you wanna learn more about that, there's a, there's a preprint available now, and this is gonna be published very shortly. So if you're interested in reproducibility, if you're interested in community-led education, we would love to hear from you and see if there's some way we can collaborate. Um, so one thing that we find is very helpful for these types of workshops uh, that are done virtually is having a place for people to take notes together and also share their thoughts in real time. So what we've created is a shared notes document, and you can see the link there in um, the uh, chat to our shared notes document. Um, so this is a place where you can write your questions. It's also a place where you can comment on the things we're talking about. So if you have experiences um, like about reproducibility, about challenges you've had, about solutions you've found, then um, this is a place for you to share that with all the other participants. Um, so here is what the uh, shared notes doc looks like right now. So just to give a practice to um, show how we would use it is um, if everyone that is able to access this right now wants to answer the quick question, how are you doing today, this afternoon? You can just put a plus one, for example, next to the emoji that reflects how you're feeling today, or you can add other here, something like, you know, need more coffee, for example. Um, so Batul, want to give that a try and everyone else that's on the uh, chat, give a plus one how you're feeling. We've got some uh, happy people here to start, so that's good. If you can't access the Etherpad, though, no worries, just use the chat. Or um, since we're a small group today, you can also unmute and ask a question that way as well. So uh, just keep in mind, this is a place for you to not only share your questions, but also share your own experiences if you um, have found something useful uh, as we go through these topics. So let's get started. Um, we're here today to just start on a lifelong journey um, about improving research over time. So we do normally these workshops over um, 90 minutes, but instead we're gonna do a half an hour and just sort of dive into two different sections, one an introduction to reproducibility and two an introduction to data management. Um, and what we try and focus on at Reproducibility for Everyone are the practical things that anyone can do that can improve their own research efficiency and accelerate research for others. So make it easier for other people to take what you've learned and build upon it. Um, but we're not trying to solve like a problem all over the world for all research that's going on. We're trying to solve a problem for you. So a lot of the things that you and I can do that improves reproducibility um, are, are things that will help other researchers reuse our work, but 
first and foremost, they're actually going to help you um, to be able to remember what you did and why you did it and be able to share your work with your closest collaborators, um, people in your own lab or yourself in the future. So that's why we think reproducibility matters. Um, but we also like to send out a survey in advance of all of our workshops. And many of you have filled that in for us. Um, uh, because the other reason why reproducibility uh, matters to us and why it could matter to you is because it's a very common problem and it's a big barrier to people's, you know, efficiency in their research to, to actually getting things done in their research. If they have a hard time getting a method to work, they have a hard time reproducing someone else's research. So as you can see here, this is from our pre-workshop survey. So some of you filled this out for us. Um, we do have some people having a hard time reproducing their own research. We have um, some people having a hard time reproducing someone else's research, but it is very, very common to have a hard time doing both. So this means, you know, taking a paper and seeing that it really applies to the question you're trying to answer and looking at that method section and trying to dive into it and reproduce it and just finding you just can't do it um, on its own. You need to keep you know, troubleshooting it, you maybe need to contact the author. These are super common problems. And when you work on solving these problems for yourself, you're actually really helping other people to solve these problems as well. So what do we mean when we say reproducibility? Uh, one thing I found over the years uh, teaching workshops for researchers is that there really isn't any shared definition of reproducibility across disciplines. And that's because every discipline has its own methods and therefore every discipline um, will require different things in order to allow other researchers to reuse their work. But here are two definitions that are a great starting point to understand when people talk about reproducible research and when people talk about replicable research, what are they talking about specifically? So reproducible research, which is what we mostly focus on, is when an author or researcher provides all the necessary data, codes, methods, all the information needed to run the analysis again, recreating the results. So if someone's published a paper, they've included all the information that you need, all the detailed methods and um, tools, and you are able to go in and rerun that exact same um, analysis using those exact same materials. So uh, when people say reproducibility, they often mean that. Um, but sometimes people use reproducibility and replicability interchangeably. Um, what replication is or replicability is something a little bit um, uh, uh, more challenging than just reproducibility. Replicability is rerunning the entire study again and gathering new data. So you're not just rerunning the analysis on the old data, you're gathering new data and you're gonna see if with this new data and the new analysis, you come to the same scientific conclusion. So that's what we're striving for is replication. Um, but in order to get there, you need to ensure that you're sharing enough information to allow people to reproduce your workshop. So I find sometimes it's helpful, this little chart, to show the difference between reproducibility and other um, modes of us sharing and redoing each other's research. So reproducibility, as I just mentioned, it's when you're sharing the same, when you are um, able to uh, rerun the uh, analyses of another researcher using the same data and the same methods. Um, if you are rerunning um, someone else's study um, with the same data, but you tweak the methods a little bit, you'll probably apply a new method, that is called robust research. So it's reproducible, but it's also robust. Um, replicability, as we mentioned previously, is when you go out and you're gathering whole new data using those uh, methods described in the paper. So you're starting from scratch, but you're trying to rerun a study. That's replication. And when you're able to do that using whole new data 
and also able to tweak the methods and get to the same results. That's what we call generalizability. And that is the gold standard. That's what we're all aiming for. But the baseline of all of this is this basic reproducibility. The ability to have all the information you need, have it detailed, have it understandable, have it possible for other people to reuse your data and your methods to get to the same results. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that uh, reproducibility is just one of the things that we should be thinking about um, as researchers. There's a lot of things that go into this idea of rigor. So science that is good, science that is rigorous, science that is logical, um, that avoids errors, that is um, honest and transparent, and that it uses appropriate methods, um, including appropriate statistics. So reproducibility is one part of this, but it is one of these things that when you work to improve your reproducibility, you'll find that you are actually making it easier for yourself to um, come back to your work in the future, to understand your work, to share your work, to collaborate. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I think it's a really helpful thing to start thinking about um, and start learning about. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that reproducibility is not um, something that is all or nothing. Um, it's a spectrum. So there isn't anybody out there that is doing 100% reproducible research um, that didn't do a, make a lot of irreproducible research in the past. So everybody, um, is uh, should strive to improve over time, should strive to um, be as transparent and open as they can with their research, to share everything that they can, but don't be intimidated by new tools and methods. Everyone has to start somewhere and no one is perfect. So what we advise at uh, Reproducibility for Everyone is to take a look at the um, handout, take a look at the slides um, and See if there's anything there that seems like it could solve a problem for you. Try that out in your next project. And every time you start a new project, try out one more thing. Um, so incrementally over the lifetime of your entire uh, career, you will be striving towards reproducible research. And that's where when we do that together as a community, we really can make a big difference. So uh, because this is only a half an hour long uh, webinar, we're not able to go over all of the very, very many factors that can decrease reproducibility. Instead, today, we're gonna focus on data management with Batool, and she's gonna talk about a few of the concrete little things that have really helped a lot of researchers get started with reproducible research, while at the same time, um, making it easier for them to find um, and and um, share their uh, materials with other researchers. So there are human factors, there's technical factors, there's problems with the way that we reward researchers, and there's problems with study design and statistics. These are just some of the things that our community has brainstormed that can contribute to uh, uh, poorly reproducible research. Um, in your survey, we asked, what is your greatest potential for growth in reproducibility? And as is very common, most of you have pointed to the um, lack of detailed methods. So that's, that's a really important thing. And if you are interested in learning more about uh, method sharing, I invite you to join our next webinar where we're going to talk a lot about sharing protocols and sharing other materials. Um, there's also a lot of other things here, including sharing data, um, increased power, uh, less pressure to publish, uh, better reagent sharing and better code sharing. So thanks to everyone who filled that in. Uh, I, we totally agree that uh, especially the sharing of methods is really essential. So in summary, um, keep in mind that everyone starts somewhere. Reproducibility is not an all or nothing thing. Every little bit helps, so try out one new tool or method with each project and you can make a huge difference. Um, and no one is perfect, so don't be intimidated if you try out a tool and you can't get it to work for you and you've got to abandon it. Just keep trying to learn over time and um, share what works for you. Uh, so adopting some of these practices isn't just good for other scientists. 
it will find, and I think especially what Batool is about to talk about in a minute, it will find it will save you time in the long run if you know how to reproduce your own work and make it easier for yourself. So with that, Batool, go ahead and, and let us know a little bit about data management. Thank you, Avril. Uh, I'm Batool, a computational biologist affiliated to the University of Liverpool, and I'm going to take you through the very first step. So you can always reach me out in my Twitter account or my email. And as April mentioned, at the bottom of the slide, we have a shared note and uh, we, we have a link for all the tools that I'm going to mention. So don't forget about it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to take you through data management. And that's really the very, very first step of the work you do. Uh, next slide please. So before you start with any kind of experiment, we usually ask how many of you go through data management plan before you get started. And most people don't, unfortunately. So actually data management is not about publishing, it's like more about avoiding the situation you find in this slide, uh, which I was in. So most people are familiar with this kind of feeling while doing their work. I know I've done something. I've now saved it in a folder somewhere. I've given it a name, but I just can't remember what it was, what it's called, or even where I saved it. So the tips that I'm going to share with you guys in the next 10 minutes or so are going to help you to tackle this kind of problem. It's going to help you manage your data better so you don't have to go back and redo the analysis again, which is something that I went through myself. Uh, next, next slide, please. So the most important message here is to have a plan before you get started. Actually, if, you, if your project is funded by someone, some funders will ask you for it, even if you don't get asked for, even if you don't get asked for it. Think about what kind of data you're going to get from the project. How can you best structure your project? How can you keep the data organized? And if you come up with very simple data management plan beforehand, it's really going to keep you happy in the long run. And if you struggle, there is a tool called DMB Tools. Uh, it's in free and open source. It's an online application from the University of California. Uh, it can help you go through some of the most important questions. But you really don't need these fancy tools. Don't try to make a complex management plan. Just to try to create a very simple plan. Don't try to incorporate everything at once. Build out your structure. See, does it work out for you or not? Next slide, please. So uh, there is one, this is one of the trivial things that many underestimate and overlook. And at the bottom here, there is a more detailed guide. You can go through it. But some of the things that you might want to think about at first, what kind of data will you be generating? How are you going to organize and store all these kind of data? With who's actually going to take responsibility? When are you going to collect this kind of data? And what information about your data should you make sure you create? And this is called metadata, which is going to not just help you, but also going to help others to understand your data more easily. So if you make this kind of a plan before you get started, over the next five years of research, you're going to thank yourself for doing that. Next slide, please. So here's a very simple tip about how you can structure your project. Um, so this is taken in spite from the Big Informatics Data School uh, book, which I really recommend, but it's not only apply for by information or computation biologists, but you can also apply it for uh, with lab researcher. So you could have a folder for your method, for your raw data, for your analysis, for your script, for your manuscript, which hopefully you'll be able to write up about your project. And most importantly, about readme file. So some people really underestimate this, the power of the readme file, but this readme file is extremely useful. It's going to contain some essential information about the files. You can put anything that's helpful in this readme file. You can include information about your data type, your data format, your data citation, about the context, about your materials, also about naming your file, which we're going to explore later. 
in the letter section. So this is going to help your future self and your current and also your future collaborator in the project. And it's going to make it easier for you to go back to your project, remember what you were doing. And if you leave in the lab and you're going to leave it eventually, it's make it easier for you to pass it to other members to catch up with what you did. Next slide, please. So you can start by populate them with a specific content that will fit in, in any of these folders. For example, if you work in, in your PhD or your master, your project is going to take more than one year. So you can put different analysis that you did in different years in the folder for the analysis. And by doing that, setting up your project structure in advance, you can keep things very, very organized. Next slide, please. So one thing that we always, always, always emphasize is to use a separate folder for your raw data and make this raw data read only. So researcher often share a horror story of data loss. For me, I did lose a chapter of my thesis when I was writing up uh, my thesis because the flash drive and my MacBook, both of them got broken. So it's not an uncommon thing to happen, especially if the lab did not back up their data. So keep a copy of your raw data and back it up at least in three locations. For example, you can sync your data between your computer, the cloud, and your university server. You can also use a hard drive as one of your backups. Next slide, please. So another thing that I mentioned earlier, which is very simple thing, but always underestimated and overlooked is file naming convention. And this is a great comic that I think all of us have created this final, the final, the final, the 22 of our project. So similar to creating a project structure, creating some simple rules about how you will name each file you create at the beginning of your project really going to go a long way of keeping your data organized and easier to work with in the future. Again, you don't need really these fancy tools to start naming your files. Next slide, please. So at first, just make a couple of rules for naming your files. Start very, very simple. What matters here, not the number of rules that you're going to use, but being consistent with these rules and make your file names both human readable and machine readable. So do include the date, do include a meaningful abbreviation, have group identifiers, document your decision, be consistent, and use virgin numbers. So virgin numbers, this can be a symbol number that added to the file name and avoid using draft or final. And just let's face it, there's nothing final when you do our search. So most importantly, if you decide what rule you're going to use, document these rules in the readme file that I mentioned earlier. It helps not only yourself later on, but also the people that are going to join the project in the future. So next slide, please. So here's a very simple example of how you can apply a few of these rules to make file naming convention. Again, uh, this may take a few seconds more, but it's going to make your life easier in the long run. You can see in the example here, if you would be as specific as possible, your file name might become really quite long. So start very simple, just to stay consistent and update it if needed over time. It's really more important to be consistent than making something very, very specific. So for me, I usually don't use project, I don't use uh, ID, but I always use date, experiment, and virgin, always and always. So try out these data management tab in your next project. Think about what kind of data you're going to generate. Create very simple design um, and a few simple rules for naming your files. As we said, class participants have found some really, really big benefit from just a few small changes. This can really save you hours, days in the future. And with that, I'm going to stop with data management and hand it over to April again. Awesome. Thank you, Bichuel. Um, So uh, in summary, uh, reproducible research practices can help you stay organized. Um, they can help you to uh, more easily share those methods that you come up with and use in your lab. 
it makes it easier for uh, people to analyze the results that you share. Um, it, uh, we're going to talk in our next uh, uh, webinar in the series about re sharing reagents, which are just like types of materials that people use in the lab, as well as sharing protocols. So those methods that you use in the lab. Um, and what all these things have in common is that they can accelerate science. So that it allows you to, uh, to move faster, to try new things quicker, to find your materials more easily, um, and to really um, you know, dive into collaborations without too much um, extra work. So uh, the um, longer version of this um, workshop is available online, and you can also join the next two uh, webinars in the series to talk more about sharing materials and sharing code and data. Um, so just uh, think today about uh, what steps can you take to improve the management of your data. Um, adopting a file naming convention is something you can start um, really easily and honestly, it is one of the most useful things that our um, participants have found, as Batul said. Um, so uh, keep in touch with us with hello at reproforeveryone.org. We're a community-led workshop uh, project, so uh, it's all researchers sharing the things that have worked for them. And we would love for any of you who are interested in reproducibility to reach out and uh, learn more. All of our materials are openly licensed, so if any of this is useful to you, um, feel free to reuse it, adapt it. You don't even need to let us know, just dive into it, but we're here to help if you want some support. Um, again, um, we didn't get here alone. We have had a lot of help along the way from our funders. Um, we also have a little survey here. We're going to have this same survey for each of the modules. So um, please let us know what you found most useful, what you think we could improve in the future. Um, and in the last few minutes, if there's anyone that has questions, please, uh, you can either use the shared notes doc. That's what we often use in these. But if uh, that isn't working for you, you can chat or unmute yourself. So in the last couple of minutes, does anyone have any uh, questions for Batul and I? 